Nick, thanks so much for, uh, for having me and, and letting me host this panel. I'm actually going to bring all of the panelists out, and then I'll just do quick introductions. Uh, Sanjay Marotra, Rani Chatterjee, and Renee Haas. Um, with me today, and I'm super honored to be able to have these three gentlemen on the panel today. Um, Sanjay is president and CEO of Micron, which arguably, in my estimation, is probably the most important semiconductor manufacturing company in the US. Uh, Ronnie is a distinguished professor from Duke who is now uh, giving to his country and serving as the, um, there's a lot in here, but <laughs> serving as the principal economic advisor to the Secretary of Commerce um, for policy development related to the U.S. competitiveness and innovation, trade, economic growth. Essentially, Ronnie is one of the key people in the CHIPS Act, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, we have Renee Haas on the end. Renee is uh, CEO of, of ARM. Uh, which, similar to, to Micron, is one of the most important semiconductor companies in the world. It actually doesn't make silicon, but enables so much of the entire ecosystem. Um, just it's a funny joke, uh, just prior to uh, ARM, uh, Rene worked at NVIDIA, so he tried to buy the company, and now he runs it. <laughs> Great. Um, so look, we're, today, today's discussion is really going to be about the industry in terms of the market technology and financial trends, and with that as a high level, Maybe we'll just kick it off with a broad, broad question uh, for you. Maybe, Sanjay, you can start us off. Why now more than ever is the industry really in our national consciousness? So I think uh, what everybody recognizes is that semiconductors absolutely form the backbone of everything that is shaping the world today, from data centers to your PCs to smartphones to industrial 4.0, smart factories, autonomous cars, IoT, everything is powered by uh, semiconductors. And if you think about it, the global economy is like hundred tr trillion dollars, hundred trillion US dollars. Twenty percent or so is durable goods. And then, you know, there are services. Durable goods, it, it, uh, they need semiconductors in one form or another. So about twenty to thirty percent by some estimations of the global economy is powered by semiconductors in one shape or another, directly or indirectly. So semiconductors are critical for the growth of the future economies. Uh, semiconductor industry is growing faster than GDP. Through the rest of this decade, semiconductor industry will outpace GDP. And within semiconductor uh, industry, by the way, memory, which Micron makes, we are the only US manufacturer of semiconductor DRAM and flash storage. Semiconductor memory, through the end of this decade, will outpace the semiconductor industry growth as well, because everything today is about data economy. All the trends around AI, autonomous, IoT, they all need semiconductors, they all need memory, they need more data. So there's a clear recognition that semiconductors are important. They are important for economic growth. Of course, recognition as well that national security, the critical infrastructure, national defense systems are relying, increasingly relying on semiconductors. And today, about 85% of semiconductors are manufactured, the wafers, the silicon, is manufactured in Asia. If you look at memory, 98% of memory silicon is made in Asia. So the supply chain, the wafers are all being made in Asia, uh, primarily in four countries for the entire semiconductor production, 85% coming from South Korea, China, Japan, and Taiwan. So obviously, it's important, and COVID taught us all that the importance of semiconductors and the importance of a diversified, balanced supply chain I think it's pretty clear to everybody that this distribution ought to improve over the course of next 10 to 20 years. And hence, so much interest by various national governments recognizing that semiconductors are important for economic growth, they're important for national security considerations, and it's important to have a balanced, resilient, diversified supply chain. And hence, um, I mean, Ronnie will, I'm sure, talk about it, but CHIPS Act, and incentives being provided by the US government to bring now more semiconductor manufacturing, silicon manufacturing onshore as well. So these are really the main considerations that are driving the trend toward uh, diversification, uh, attempt to diversify the global supply chain. 
That's a, unless anyone wants to comment, that's actually a great segue. Uh, Renee, maybe I was going to ask you, as you think about all the supply uh, chain constraints we had over the last couple of years, all of your customers, frankly, having to live through all of that, um, how do you see that playing out in the future? And um, you know, how might that evolve to avoid future uh, supply chain issues? Well, I've been in this industry, I like to say 35 plus years. It sounds a lot better than 40. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the cycles have existed um, forever in our industry. Um, when you think about what it takes to build a, a semiconductor manufacturing facility, the capital expenditures, and Sanjay knows this <laughs> much better than I do, the, the cycle times associated with ordering that equipment, these are big bets that one has to make relative to supply and demand. So we're in the, you know, we were in a very, very um, supply-based crunch for a number of years, driven by the pandemic and all, a number of other things. But I would say that going forward, I, I still, my own personal opinion is that this supply-demand curve will const probably constantly exist in our industry. It's just a natural given the fact that uh, the expenditures are so large. But more importantly, the demand, I just don't see ceasing. You know, to, to Sanjay's point, the um, semiconductors are so ubiquitous in terms of, you know, what is in our lives. If you look in your home, uh, your smart TV, your home security system, your car, th these are computers. Uh, 25 years ago, these were not computers. These did not have any kind of content. Now they've got memory, they've got microprocessors, they've got sensors, and, and that's only going to continue when you think about how it's made our lives easier. So I think Secular long-term demand, 100% agree with Sanjay, that is going to uh, outpace GDP. I think we will, though, continue to see kind of supply and demand perturbations because it's, it's really hard to predict when these cycles start and when they stop. We're, we're in a down cycle now. I can almost assuredly tell you that it's going to stop and it's going to start again and the demand is going to be really, really strong. And Ronnie, 10, 15, 20 years ago when we thought about government investment in the industry, we thought about DARPA grants maybe, yeah. and you know, a few other small things. But what role going forward do governments more broadly, and specifically the US government, how do you think about the issues that, that, that um, uh, both, both Sanjay and Renee talked about on the supply chain side, and more importantly, on the investment side? Well, thanks for being here. And uh, I want to say it's great to be with Sanjay and Renee also on the panel. So inside the U.S. government, I can give you a sense of how we've been thinking about these trends and how it led to the creation of the CHIPS program. If you think about what we were seeing during the pandemic, I joined the Commerce Department in April of 2021. And 2021 was a year where prices were rapidly increasing. One third of inflation was driven by automobile prices. And so the first thing my boss would ask me as Secretary of Commerce is, what explains automobile prices increasing? If you think about that, it's supply and demand. <coughs> But why weren't there enough supply of new and used cars? A lot of it had to do with the supply of chips. And exactly what Renee is talking about, we kind of taken for granted that semiconductors, computer chips, whatever parlance you use, is a really important but overlooked component of automobiles. And it's not just the things that you might think are very fancy in the car. Of course, it's things that you know, chips monitor the tire pressure. They're part of the driver assist system. They're part of the airbag. All these things need to be in the automobile for you to get it sold to you. So dealers were having these cars on their lots without chips and they weren't able to sell them. Supply demand imbalance led to prices increasing and that had a huge impact on the macroeconomic environment which is something I track every day. The second piece was national security as Sanjay mentioned. We saw during the pandemic and subsequently with Russia's invasion of Ukraine what could happen when supply is concentrated in just one part of the world and what kind of leverage that has geopolitically. And these issues that Sanjay is talking about are important for the United States of America because chips are at every single one of our defense equipment pieces as well and our national security. So in Washington, there was this recognition, one, the supply chain resilience topic wasn't just some esoteric academic discussion, it had real economic impact. Second, the national security piece was a real and present risk for the United States. And third, the kinds of fads that Sanjay and other people are building around the United States, there's a lot of jobs. And you think about manufacturing in this country and how much we had offshored and outsourced to other countries, we'd hollowed out a lot of those jobs, particularly for people without a college degree. And the ability to bring these fabs to the United States and create those opportunities for folks um, was also incredibly important. So for those three reasons, we thought, look, this is a great time to make sure that we actually make strategic public investments in a key industry. And that's what the Chips and Science Act is all about. I can double click on that later on, but I'll just say, we're in Silicon Valley where you know, when I came off the plane, someone said, well, that's, that's a hard sell, talking about strategic public investments in the heart of capitalism. But you all know that history of Silicon Valley comes from the same exact place, right? I mean, if you think about the post-World War II era, the defense contracts that underpin the creation of all the research at Stanford, I mean, the existence of the semiconductor and the integrated circuit that came from TI and NASA, 
that was a classic example of demand pull from the government creating a commercial market. And we're going to do something like that again if we're successful with the Chips and Science Act. So that's where we're coming from on the government side. And uh, Sanjay, Renee, and other players in this system are obviously, they're, they're going to be incredibly important to the success. Our job is to set the foundation for that kind of entrepreneurship, innovation, and technology commercialization to take place. When you think about that industry today, the global semiconductor TAM is about $600 billion, up about four times in, in, in the last 20 years. Um, and that's mostly because it's penetrated every application, several hundred dollars in a car to several thousands of dollars in a car. Uh, so if we think we have issues today in an industry that's growing fast, maybe they get way more complicated going forward. So, Renee, I guess my question to you is, when we look around the corners, um, what are the things that are going to drive those trends for the next Forex expansion that we need to be thinking about from a supply chain, from manufacturing people, et cetera, perspective? Yeah, well, I think you know, AI is, is the obvious number one candidate. Um, there's been so much talk even the last couple of weeks about um, chat GPT, generative type of AI. Uh, when you think about these complex uh, learning model models, uh, large language models, what's required in terms of compute capability, it's very, very significant. Uh, the, the amount of compute power it's going to take to address these type of AI problems is going to be very significant. So I think that's going to be a huge opportunity. I do think it has to be um, tempered with uh, efficiency. You know, one of the things that our company uh, historically has been known for has been inside just about every smartphone on the planet. Uh, when we look forward in terms of the data center of tomorrow, uh, power efficiency we think is going to be critical because um, if you just look at uh, today, it's 1 to 2 percent of the world's electricity goes in the data centers. In some countries, it's already north of 10 percent. That's not sustainable uh, at all. Um, new plants that are being built are going to have a fixed area in terms of square footage. They're going to have a fixed area in terms of kilowatt hours. So making sure that these new data centers and compute demands are efficient is going to be very, very critical because, because the compute demands I see are just going to be rising exponentially. And maybe, Sanjay, you can comment on the technology trends that are going to be important uh, for, 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 these, for these transitions as well. So clearly, as Rene said, completely agree with him that AI is the big trend and will be shaping the future and very, very early innings there. So when we talk about a chat GPT, uh, a chat GPT, for example, a server for chat GPT requires five times more memory than a standard server. So AI, again, a trend of needing more data, gleaning more insights from data, requires more and more data to make better and better, more intelligent decisions. So it's a big driver. I can speak for the memory part of it, because AI needs compute. It needs high-performance compute. It certainly needs memory, a lot of data, a lot of DRAM, a lot of storage. And it needs, of course, connectivity. And all of this has come together with the software algorithms that have existed for decades. And now, all of this coming together, really the time has come for AI to become a big force. So memory trend in terms of what Rene just spoke about, low power, extremely important. High performance memory, high bandwidth memory is really critically important as well. And um, you know, chat GPT, um, supercomputer, I mean, considered among the top five with respect to performance, fastest supercomputers in the world. Super uh, f f top 500 supercomputers rated chat GPT as among the top five. And that has 285,000 um, uh, CPU cores, 10,000 GPUs, and 400 gigabit per second connectivity. And all of this requiring a lot of trend with respect to memory, high performance compute, these will be the trends. And the trend will also be for memory and compute to come together, to come closer together. Whether that happens through packaging or through advanced innovative solutions that are bringing memory and uh, compute logic together in the future, in the coming years, I think these will be the trends that will absolutely be driving the AI engines of the future. 
And when you think about that growth, a lot of it will be coming from the larger companies who have the ability to invest. Uh, but a lot of it also be coming from smaller and private companies. Hopefully, that Celeste, I'm sure, will fund m many of the most interesting ones along the way. Um, it's just a, one quick stat. In the last five or so years, about $15 billion was invested in private, non-China-based semiconductor companies, which is twice the amount that was invested in almost the two decades prior to that. Um, if you think about the CapEx budgets of Samsung, TSMC, you know, Intel combined, it's probably close to $100 billion, $75, $100 billion in any given year. Um, you know, Ronnie, talk to us about how you think about a $50 billion bucket coming out over some billions of years and how you think about deploying that to make the right bets you know, across whether it's in the industry, companies, manufacturing, or the whole broader ecosystem to, to support a lot of the things that both these guys just talked about. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the stat because the, so the Chips and Science Act appropriated $52.7 billion to fund the construction of fabs and supply chain across the US and to invest in research and development as well as workforce uh, and defense applications. So in Washington, 52.7 billion right, in the context of a broader budget um, doesn't sound like a big number when you're talking about trillions. When you talk about a program, though, to strategically invest in industry, it is quite large in our history. And if you think about the Commerce Department, that annual budget is about $14 billion. A $52.7 billion program is, is quite large. And so when the CHIPS Act was passed in August of this past year, I moved to the White House, where I currently coordinate the CHIPS Act across the Commerce Department, Treasury, Department of Defense, and the State Department. And so in that role, I've been thinking a lot about how, long that, how far that money can go. Two things I'll note. One is that if you look at the contribution from private industry, which is going to be essential here, we've already crowded in about $300 billion of investments from private companies into the semiconductor ecosystem since the CHIPS Act was first proposed. So if this is going to be successful, we can't just focus on the government piece of it. The government piece of it is supposed to be the foundation by which we build private sector investment on top of it. I think you're already seeing that. And you know, for another panel, you're also seeing that in electrical, electric vehicles and the foundation for a clean economy. So that's what we're looking for. The second thing I'll say is we have to be cognizant that there's more than just the fabrication facilities, the fabs. There also has to be a broader supply chain. And that's going to include a lot of the small, medium-sized enterprises, to your point. So we are thinking a lot about mapping the supply chain, trying to understand where those gaps are, whether it's in critical minerals or advanced packaging, and trying to make sure that we also set up a system to support those as well. The challenging thing about supply chains, which everyone in the audience knows, is that you have more information in the private sector than we have in the public sector. So a lot of this needs to be done in partnership, a lot of this needs to be done with humility on our sense to make sure that we understand where those gaps are. We also want to set up the program to align incentives. We want these investments to be productive and successful because we know that there's skepticism when the government takes on a big project like this. And we know there's been past examples where these kinds of industrial strategies haven't worked. And so first and foremost in our mind is how we basically place these bets in a way that has good governance but also has the highest likelihood of paying off. And that's how we're thinking about the questions that you're talking about right now. So far, I think we've seen a lot of positive encouragement. And you know, the president called out chips in the State of the Union, so that was a good sign as well. Noni, I would just add to your comments that uh, in addition to the 52 billion, which is needed for the semiconductor companies to bridge the cost gap that exists today with Asia, the cost gap today, as you well know, is 35 to 45 percent in terms of production in the U.S. versus production in overseas in Asia, and primarily due to the incentives that the overseas governments have provided over the last couple of decades. So yes, 52 billion is an important to get started with respect to uh, the upfront investments that are needed to build fabs. But another very important element of CHIPS Act is the investment tax credits. Yes. Investment tax credits that projects that are successful over time, that are able to invest and grow, they are able to get 25% investment tax credit benefit. And that's what will help bridge the cost gap with Asia. And for a company like Micron, that's extremely important to have the combination of CHIPS grants as well as investment tax credits. And this is, I know, important for other semiconductor manufacturing companies as well. Both are needed to bridge that cost gap. And for memory, about 60% plus of memory wafers that are produced worldwide actually are um, or let me say it this way. The worldwide semiconductor wafers that are produced 
by all semiconductors, global semiconductors combined, 60% of those wafers are memory wafers. So even though memory represents about 30% of the semiconductor revenue worldwide, about 60% of the wafers that are made in the semiconductor industry are memory wafers. So when CHIP's grant process looks at this, it has to, of course, look at not just logic. It has to look at memory. It has to, of course, look at analog sensors and other uh, devices as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a great segue for the next one. Uh, and maybe, Renee, I'll, I'll go to you first on this. As you think about the breadth and scale of the industry and the ecosystem more broadly, and frankly, of a manufacturing company and an IP model both represented up here, and Ronnie has to sort of balance between all of that and all the other things and back end and, and supply chain. But, Renee, maybe you can comment on why is a company like ARM just as important as a large IDM um, such as Intel? And why is it so vital in the broader ecosystem to continue to fund IP models um, and, uh, and, and all of the other things that need to get support, that need to come than just silicon design and engineering? Well, well thank you for the shout out. I, I do think we are a very important <laughs> company. Uh, the, the semiconductor value slash supply chain is really complicated. Uh, you've got uh, the wafers you've got them packaging, you've got the circuits that go inside. Not everyone can do everything relative to building a, a chip. Uh, the IP industry, I think, didn't exist 35, 40 years ago. Um, and now it's completely vital to how, uh, how our process works. Uh, where we fit in is we basically provide a, a blueprint, uh, if you will, or a, uh, a design that we license to companies to go off and build chips. Because given the complexity of these products, it's quite, quite vital to be able to, uh, to do that. I think going forward, there's some very interesting opportunities though, that, are, that are going to take place. You know, Sanjay alluded to it a little bit. You know, the system on a chip, uh, which allowed for incredible innovation and, and, uh, and advancement over the last uh, decades, um, is now starting to hit uh, some walls relative to what you can actually integrate and put inside a, a monolithic die that's two nanometers. So one of the things that, that we see happening uh, in the industry, and we've seen it uh, in some of the other markets, and we think in the next five to 10 years it'll be everywhere, is the, uh, the disaggregation of the SOC, if you will, where now inside this uh, large package is uh, a number of smaller die, and some of those die will be very specialized. Some will be compute die that will be on the most advanced nodes because you need high performance compute. But other things such as you know, Wi-Fi, let's say, or other technology that doesn't need the leading edge nodes will be on a different process. Uh, then when you talk about integrating memory uh, from Micron, you know, inside this very, very complex package, you have interconnect, uh, interconnect technology, you have thermals, you have an incredibly complex device that needs to be built. So I think uh, in that going forward, it's going to be a huge opportunity for not only a lot of innovation, but I think the IP uh, companies play, like ourselves, play a very, very key role because some of these subsystems, uh, let's say a compute die that might have a CPU or a GPU or an interconnect, uh, that IP may uh, be mostly ARM-based, for example. So in that world, uh, we play a very, very vital role, uh, and not to mention the, the software ecosystem on top of it. But I think this, uh, you know, everyone has been talking about the death of Moore's Law ever since I started in the industry. It's very clear that when you get to two nanometers and below, something has to be done differently just to make the economics uh, make sense. So I think this, um, this multi-die approach, particularly the mix and match, adding memory and such, uh, that will be the standard, I think, five to 10 years from now, which will be uh, affording huge opportunities for, uh, for new companies and innovation. And at the other end of the spectrum, Sanjay, you have proprietary manufacturing. <laughs> Why is it so vital for some companies to be able to do everything fully integrated? And we haven't even talk, talked about software, and if we have time, maybe we'll get to that later. But why is it so important to have proprietary manufacturing, almost, as I said, the other end of the spectrum from enabling an entire industry with, with, with selected dye? So memory is the leading edge of semiconductor manufacturing and highly complex process technology, but not just process technology, the design of the chip, the package, the quality considerations, all the tests. All of this is needed, and memory it is uh, an industry that operates, as I mentioned earlier, at a very large scale. Memory represents, again, 60% plus of the semiconductor industry's wafers. So memory requires large scale, requires large scale of investment, capex, advanced technologies. Renee talked about importance of performance, importance of power, 
quality, applications are diversifying from data center applications to mobile devices to automotive and industrial applications, memory is everywhere. So there is a diversification of technologies that is needed to address the broad base of end market applications for memory. Again, memory is everywhere. So this then, when you look at the CapEx considerations, you look at scale and you look at the complex technologies and different technologies that are needed to address the various end market applications, it really best fits with the semiconductor companies that have R&D capability as well as the manufacturing capability. Of course, the other big piece in for memory is cost is religion for memory. It's a very cost sensitive industry it has, and you need scale to be able to have cost as well. You cannot be building these memory chips through third parties where you have to pay their margin as well and on top of it need complex technologies to be supported to meet the varying needs of the end market applications. Hence you see that memory is today manufactured by those that really have the vertical integration capability. The R&D, the manufacturing expertise, test, quality, packaging, and going all the way to understanding applications, and yes, understanding the software ap aspects of those applications as well. So th this is why, by the way, I used to be, uh, had co-founded SanDisk. SanDisk for the first 10 to 15 years was actually relying on third parties to make memory was relying on foundries to make memory, and it became very clear very quickly, and this I'm talking about way back in 90s and uh, early 2000 time frame. It became very clear that that was not the right model to be building memory for large-scale requirements with third-party foundries. We needed to be able to control our own destiny with respect to cost capability, with respect to driving scale, and then we went to this model at SanDisk. Micron has been doing this for four decades plus, building its own fabs and memory. So those are the considerations that go into making your own memory, and cost, again, is a very big piece of this. Which is, these two points, I think, are emblematic of a big challenge globally <laughs> and in the US government, which is, how do we identify and enforce supply chain resilience? I mean, look at how complicated the supply chain is. And if you, I worked in the Obama administration before this one. If somebody asked me back then, who's the supply chain person, I wouldn't have been able to tell you, right? We weren't thinking about supply chains the way we are now. But during the pandemic, really for the first time, governments around the world started to think about, okay, what are the different pieces of the supply chain? And we need data, we need people, we need expertise to get that right, and that's a work in progress. We need to coordinate better across government. We also need to coordinate better with our partners and allies because these supply chains we're talking about span the entire world. And as you see both CEOs and politicians talking about sort of the rewiring of global supply chains, I think it'll be interesting to see how different industries, this one, but a lot of the other ones at the topics of this conference are gonna change and how quickly that's gonna happen. On the government side, I think we need to do a better job, frankly, of getting information from the private sector about how these supply chains actually work. Because unlike a lot of other data that I work with as an economist, let's say census data tells me where people live and where they work and what their wage is, we have better data inside the government on, on, on that than you have on the outside. On supply chains, it's the opposite. The private sector has much better data than the public sector. And that's a big gap when thinking about policy in semiconductors or, or any other area. So that's something we're thinking about a lot right now. Um, maybe shifting gears a bit, Let's talk a bit about sort of silicon expertise going in-house, mm. if you will, into some of the large hyperscalers and how the industry can, <coughs> excuse me, interact with the hyperscalers, partner with them to continue to innovate and create new, um, sorry, <coughs> to continue to innovate and, uh, and support the growth in cloud, which would be a good topic for the next, the next one as well. Maybe, Renee, you can kick that one off. Sorry. No, no problem. So the... Um there's been a lot of discussion over the years about the, the verticalization, if you will, of, of some of these companies who are uh, doing their own silicon. Um, you know, at some level we've seen that uh, already. And you know, if you look at uh, large smartphone manufacturers, there are, there are those who have their own um, in-house capabilities of building on devices. Uh, when you look at the hyperscalers, though, there, they, there are some unique dimensions to the problems that, uh, that they're solving. Uh, there are a number of them who, who have extremely large internal workloads that they service, uh, whether it's around search or video, you can guess the companies I'm talking about. Th these are very, very specific <laughs> workloads that are run. They're very, very compute intensive. But most importantly, the hyperscalers know how to solve them best. So when you look at the ability to build a custom chip 
to uh, have the compute complex, the interconnect complex, the memory subsystem, network storage. Uh, it can make a lot of sense uh, relative to doing uh, their own devices. Um, and I think that's a trend that is, uh, is going to continue, candidly. Um, you know, we, we think about it maybe more around specialized computing, where uh, these uh, very, very specific designs that have unique workloads that can only be done by a specific con configuration. Back to your question about you know, IP, where that fits in the subsystem, uh, in the ecosystem. That's a great example, right? Because using uh, IP and then using off-the-shelf products, these companies can build uh, amazing technology. And when we've seen that, whether it's uh, AWS or, or some of the other large uh, hyperscalers, and we do think that's a trend that's just going to continue, particularly when, when you add AI workloads onto it. Uh, and when the AI workloads get added onto it and they become fundamental in terms of how those uh, internal workloads are off-balanced, I think that trend only continues. And this is a great one for all, maybe all three. If you think about, and it would be great to understand all of your perspectives on how the industry can be kind of a force for good, if you will, what opportunities, yeah. obligations does the semiconductor industry have to fight things like climate change, um, train a diverse and inclusive workforce, uh, or to promote ethical AI? What, what, what can the industry be doing and how, and, and I guess, Ronnie, when it's your turn as well, how does the government sort of look at all of these things as well as you're thinking about deploying um, capital and influencing the overall, the overall sector? Maybe, um, maybe we'll start, Ronnie, with you. Sure, I mean, to me, I mean, that question is what kind of ties together the panel and, and why we're all here. I mean, if you think about the amazing technological trends that are shaping the industries that, you know, Renee and Sanjay are participating in, and you think about the role of the government strategically supporting key sectors for national competitiveness, it comes together here, the private and the public interest, right? That's the question. And from my perspective, I think a lot about the workforce issue in terms of who's going to work in these facilities that are being built all around the United States. You know, Sanjay's investment in upstate New York, um, Intel's investment in um, Ohio, TSMC's investment in Arizona. What will be the opportunity for folks who don't necessarily have to go to college to work inside those fabs? What's going to be the opportunity to be a machine operator or work on the HVAC? And how do we help people get an on-ramp into those jobs? Because for a long time, right, these jobs have really, haven't really been available to everybody. And there's a lot of folks who never would think of themselves working in manufacturing, much less working in a fab. And so I think part of the solution has to be partnerships like the one Sanjay's already doing with community colleges and training institutes to make sure people first are aware of the jobs. You have to make sure people understand what's out there and what the job is, and that takes work. And then second, that they can get the skills they need to work in an actual job that exists. Too many of our training programs around the country are basically train and pray, which means you train someone and you just hope they find a job on the other end. That's not good enough anymore. We need to figure out how to actually train people for jobs that exist. Very difficult, because the private sector is obviously dynamic and those requirements change. At the same time, we have to give people a general set of skills to work across an industry, not just for a specific company. Again, that's a challenge. Not many businesses want to train someone who's going to leave for the competitor the next day. These are some problems we need to solve to fulfill the promise of having semiconductor manufacturing in the US yield public benefits. The second piece I'll say is the community benefit. And Sanjay has signed this in Syracuse and Clay, New York. You see this with Intel's investment in Ohio. The regional benefit can be immense if these things are done right. And if you visit these locations, and Sanjay can tell you about them as well, you will see such enthusiasm for folks who haven't always seen these big investments in their backyard. The opportunity to actually grow up and go to school and then work in the place you're from is really, really special opportunity in these places. And most Americans, despite having a very mobile workforce, don't move in adulthood more than 20 miles away from their house. So we're talking about creating jobs where people live and good quality jobs. And that's going to not just be in the fab, but it's also going to be across the supply chain and all the indirect benefits. But that doesn't just happen by accident. We need, we need people on the ground level, regional partnerships, university leaders, small business owners to come together to make sure that, again, the talent pipeline syncs up with need. That's where government can play a role and identify. In the end, though, I think we're maybe the ones to convene and bring people together around these topics. It's going to be business leaders who solve the challenge. And I hate to put it on Renee and, and Sanjay, but I, at the end, they know their business well. They know the opportunities they're going to create. We should set the table to make these things happen, not just in the locations I mentioned, but hopefully all over the country. Yeah, yeah and I would, I would say that and again, to repeat myself, we have an obligation to solve this power efficiency problem. And I think it's a system-wide issue. It's not just the IP that ARM creates, but it's the memory from Sanjay. It's the system design. Uh, it's everything associated with it. I think in the State of the Union speech, there was a comment that we, we might need oil for another 10 years, for example. Uh, I think the industry needs to get more ambitious and aggressive. Um, when you think about 
states like California wanting to go full EV in the next 15, 20 years, the, the power grid's not going to be able to support that, <laughs> which basically means that the automobiles need to be much more efficient in terms of the computers that are inside them and the batteries that are there. And I, and I think it's a, it's a big issue around sustainability. Uh, and I think it can't be solved by one company. It's an ecosystem problem. But I think the industry needs to take it very seriously. And uh, back to the comment that how ubiquitous our products are and everything that um, we uh, work and live, it's upon us as an industry to solve it. So I'll touch on um, both the workforce as well as uh, the sustainability aspects of a semiconductor industry, particularly how Micron sees this. So CHIPS Act, through its investments and uh, through the investment tax credits, uh, will, and all the projects that have been announced and many more potentially to come, this, it's expected, will create about 50,000 direct jobs inside the semiconductor industry, will add 50,000 jobs, and about half a million indirect jobs in the semiconductor industry. So this, of course, workforce development is a huge challenge and a tremendous opportunity, and this absolutely requires that we do bring into the workforce, with, into the semiconductor industry, all those underrepresented groups. Reach out to the rural communities, bring out more blacks, Hispanics, veterans, underrepresented groups. And in this regard, what um, Ronnie referred to earlier, Micron's project in Syracuse, where we have announced that over the course of 20 uh, years, Micron will be investing $100 billion. We have committed that as part of those investments, um, and by the way, construction is a big part of those half a million jobs. Construction is a very big deal in semiconductors. Semiconductors fabs, there is construction going on at all times, and high-skilled construction, these are high-paying jobs. So we have committed that 30% of our eligible construction spend will be from um, minority or uh, veterans, or uh, other underrepresented groups, including women, bringing more women into construction. 20% of our eligible operating expenses will be diverted toward these underrepresented groups as well. And of course, focusing on childcare in order to enable women and others that care for family members to be able to join the workforce. So workforce development is a tremendous focus, it's a huge challenge. Our CHRO, as we look at these projects, for her, the biggest responsibility is how to really work with the community, work with the institutions, develop the STEM workforce over the next many years from high schools, middle schools, community colleges, and uh, research institutions as well. On the sustainability piece, just like Rene, I think it's, it is absolutely the responsibility of all of the businesses to take the right steps in terms of helping the climate and helping our planet in this regard. So Micron has made commitments that by 2050, we will be zero emissions. But 2050, of course, is way far out there. So we have milestones that we have identified. For example, by 2025, 100% renew renewable operations here in the US. So the fabs that we'll build in Syracuse or another big project that we'll be having <coughs> in Boise, Idaho, we will be making sure that from the get-go, these are uh, targeted toward 100% renewable energy. Um, of course, in our selection for New York site, uh, access to uh, clean energy, reliable energy, water was an important consideration as well. So um, by 2030, we expect to reduce <coughs> our emissions versus 2018 levels by 42%, which is in line with the Paris Accord as well. So absolutely, uh, for semiconductor companies um, like Micron, focus on workforce <coughs> development, bringing diverse, diversity into the workforce, and focusing on sustainability objectives is an important priority. We've got about a minute left <coughs> to do speed round. Um, we have one of the great infrastructure investors in the world, and Celesta, we have incredible entrepreneurs out there. Each have, I guess, 20 seconds. What would you invest in today, or what company would you start today, or what, what are, what's critical when you look around the corners? <laughs> Obviously, you don't have to talk about things that are at all competitive to where you are, but some insights for the broader group. Gosh, it, it's, it's, <laughs> as they always say, a downturn's a great time to start a company, and, and, and now is one of, one of those. 
uh, I think anything you know, in the AI space, uh, it, it, you're going to be golden. And whether that's into the data centers, in, into cars, I think also in hardware and software, uh, there can't be enough in terms of things that just make writing <coughs> software easier, making software easier to develop, and putting more products on platforms. Ronnie? I mean, I'll say, you don't need company advice from me, but what I will say is one perspective I do have is um, all of you in the audience, whether you're deploying capital or you're in operating roles, you have a tremendous amount to offer the economic strategy that we're trying to put into place. Because when you think about the bipartisan infrastructure law, when you think about the CHIPS Act, when you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, the success of all those will be dependent on what the private sector does with those incentives, how much investment there is, whether the workforce is prepared. And there's a lot of connections that need to be made through public and private partnership. And so if you're someone who's thinking about ways to deploy your skills in these industries that haven't always been in the spotlight, haven't always been in the State of the Union, this is a great time for folks from the private sector to engage. Some people will come to government and work for a couple years. Others will join panels and advisory boards. I'm glad to be a resource of folks who are interested in that. So my bet would be definitely go start a company, follow innovation. But there's also room to deploy your skills uh, in the service of the public across uh, and all these bills I've been talking about, the CHIPS Act, are bipartisan. And so I hope that more than a few people will consider that, because I think your skills are really at a premium now. Completely agree with Rene regarding the trends of AI and tremendous opportunities in hardware and software that it, it unleashes for products and solutions and technologies. I also just want to say that in manufacturing, um, in our fabs, we have at this point half a million sensors. We have 250 million control points. We take 20 million images of silicon wafers that are being produced every week and 30 petabyte of data constantly being analyzed um, and processed. Tremendous opportunity for driving uh, smart manufacturing techniques in semiconductor industry, bringing together hardware, software, AI into manufacturing capabilities I think tremendous opportunities. And ultimately, these techniques, these sensors, this data analytics leads us to predictive maintenance. It leads us to faster time to market of advanced technology, faster ramp up of yields in production, and faster ramp up of high quality that applications such as automotive, such as data centers, including hyperscalers and others demand today. So a lot of opportunity in smart manufacturing as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much. It's really been my honor and pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.